Hello and welcome to day three of our week of presentations to celebrate involvement. My name is Helen Clish and I work in the involvement team. I've been working in involvement about 20 years now and I've been pleased to see attitudes towards patients and carers having a say has improved over that time. I still get puzzled looks from people I meet when I say I work in involvement but people begin to understand what it means when you ask if they want to have a say in how they're treated um, and if you explain how much we can learn from their experience. We have some interesting presentations for you today on the theme of communication and information. The first of our presentations today is about the Adult Social Care Information Project, about working to make information about our social care services more easily available. Thank you, Helen, for that introduction. I'd like to share with you an overview on a current project which sits within the Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent care group. As we heard on Tuesday's event, the core purpose of user and carer involvement must be to improve people's lives, to improve health services and how each of us experience those services if and when we need them and is often reactive based upon the feedback that people who use our services provide. Involvement projects are driven by feedback we receive through various methods such as PALS concerns, experience surveys, comment cards and also from our Mystery Shopper programme which Louise discussed at Monday's event. Unfortunately at times we don't always get it right for our service users and carers and perhaps we haven't communicated in a way which our service users, carers and their families can understand. We know that a one-size-all approach is not perfect. Each of us are individual and have individual needs that we need to be aware of. So what have our service users and carers told us? Well, they've told us that they do not understand the social care process and they are not always aware of costs associated with care packages. So what have we done? We've listened to our service users and carers and we understand that life can be difficult and at times we may need support with our everyday things to maintain as much control and independence as possible. In order for you to fully understand, we need to ensure that our communication and information to you is provided in a way that you can understand. So what are we doing? We've looked at the aim of the project and we need to understand the service user and carer's perspective to review and co-produce our current literature to achieve a cohesive, functional and supportive working group to explore the perceptions of our users and carers and what's important to them. Also, how can we improve our service to them? So what are we doing as a result? Well, we are working with our social care colleagues, involvement representatives, research and practice for adults, where we've used some of their information, and our partners, Staffordshire County Council, to review the existing information and co-produce a repository of information which will be available to our service users, carers and their families to support their journey. We've also looked at the common questions which are being asked. For example, will I have to pay? How long will it take? And who do I contact? And from this, we have co-produced a frequently asked questions fact sheet. This information will be accessible through a number of channels, be it electronic and in paper form, which will be contained within the patient's handheld file so that service users, carers and their families can read and digest which will allow them to make fully informed decisions. Staff within the Trust will also have access via the Social Work Learning Academy platform. So with all our involvement projects, what is the impact? Well at present it is still under development, however it is envisaged that as a result we will receive fewer PALS concerns, we will improve our communication and information to you. Our service users, carers and their families will be better informed to make decisions. And we want to ensure that our service users, carers and families have a positive experience of care. 
which in turn will enhance quality of life for people with care and support needs. Thank you for telling us about that project. Next, we're going to hear from one of the recovery workers who has taken a, um, the role in our inclusion substance misuse services. I'm the volunteer coordinator and service user rep lead for Inclusion Isle of Wight. I'm Jude, joined by Jude, who is one of our recovery workers, who has actually come up through our volunteering programme. Um, thanks for joining us today, Jude, and giving us a bit of your time. I know you're very busy. Um, I just wondered, could you sort of share with us some of the changes you've seen since it went from the previous trust to inclusion and how your journey sort of come about to you being where you are? Okay, um, when I first came into the service, it was it was still Iris. Um, coming into the service, as I was very unwell. Um, I needed support, I needed help. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing, what even what support was available, what help I was going to get. Um, I just knew I needed to do something. Uh, so I came in, I started attending some of the groups um, within Iris. So I, I wasn't keen. Um, I couldn't see the benefit that I was getting. But gradually over time, it started to become, I wasn't going because I felt I had to, I was going because I wanted to and I was starting to get something out of the groups and out of the people, the support that I was getting from the groups. Um, I was regularly attending, it was the Ritz group, twice a week and then a couple of afternoon alcohol awareness and things like that and there was these, you know, the words that Iris was going to finish, it was going to be taken over by another company, it was quite unsettled. I was sad because I was enjoying the groups and I thought maybe that was going to come to an end. Uh, I'd started to make some progress in my recovery. Yeah. And I still want, you know, I wanted to attend the groups, but I thought, well, where, you know, where's my place going to be in this? Uh, as inclusion come in, there was a lot of talk, a lot of change, a lot of talking about volunteering. Um, and all I really wanted to do was stay there and just still attend the groups. But I thought, you know, I'm at a point now where other people need to be, you know, should be attending these groups. Um, there was a talk of the volunteering. People said that maybe I should go for it as a volunteer. And I felt it was totally out of my reach. It certainly wasn't something that I was capable of doing. Uh -huh. So I held back for a little bit. But as time went on, I thought, well, if I can be, you know, I can be a part of the group. Maybe I can show new people coming in the support that I got to be able to give that back to them yeah and that was as far as I sort of as I was going to see it going then as it went on there was training opportunities again I was just taking it as this is just something to do for the now but again as time went on the training it started meeting people that had been through on the mainland volunteer program um the motivation we got from the training and the support we were getting, it made it something that I really actually wanted to do. And thought, so, yeah, I'll, you know, I'm really going to go for this as a volunteer and really put some work into this. And again, it was still only along the lines of, you know, I could support people in groups and just be there for new people coming into the service. Um, as time's gone on, and because of the opportunities I've been given, I've learned so much and you know people were saying to me you can do this and over time you know more and more belief in myself I could do it mm, and it's really it's gone from there and then there come a point last year where I think my confidence you know I felt secure I felt safe I trusted the people I was working with and I, I went from there and moved up the stages of volunteering always supported started taking on more and more you know responsibility within the hub but it was always supervised and then the opportunity come up to possibly go on to paid work again I still thought that was well that's not going to happen I'm happy you know I could see the opportunities were there within inclusion but I didn't think it was something that I would be capable of doing uh -huh. and as it was you know I was offered the opportunity to work it was done at a really good pace that I was still, you know, I was still learning on the job. 
sort of getting that support I needed. Um, begun work as an engagement worker, learned an awful lot through that. And again, it was, okay, well, I'm happy where I am. I'll stay with this. I've reached my level of what I can do. But then again, because, you know, there's training and the support, the role of recovery worker came up and just went for it. And it's really grown from there. But I, just, I feel like the learning that I've had in the lead up to it has put me in that place where I can, I feel secure and I can, I can do this. And it's been done at a pace that was, that suited me. It was done at my pace. Yes, yeah. So it certainly, from coming into Iris, very not well. Um, thinking I'd be in there for a few weeks and hopefully make some sense of my life. It's completely, <laughs> yeah. changed, completely changed my life. So to where you're sat now. Yeah. To where I am now. It sounds like an amazing journey you've been on. Um, you, you know, and it sounds like you've really um, immersed yourself in everything, all the challenges <laughs> you've been faced with and, you know, getting into recovery and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And it, it's good that you've had that support because it's, it's massive isn't it that you supported through these stages um and and yeah. you know the training has been given you, you know and now you're sat uh, as a recovery worker within our service is yeah. you know inspiration to service users and volunteers alike really showing that you you can really embrace this stuff and move forward and make a really nice career for yourself and um yeah uh, it's, it's just amazing um so yeah thank you very much for your time today um, it's really appreciated that you share your story with us um, and yeah I'll let you get back to your busy timetable. Um, thank, you. thank you very much Jude. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. It's great to hear what's happening in inclusion. One consultation is the subject of our next video. This is an app that's being used as an alternative to face-to-face -face contact so that we can deliver services safely to our patients. Hello, it's Midland Partnership NHS Foundation Trust Involvement Celebration Week 2020, and this year we're celebrating the impact of involvement during change. What better year to be celebrating change and how important a role involvement is than in a year that we've had to endure the pandemic of COVID-19 since March. In my role as Associate Director of IMT Transformation, I've been busier than ever working with the Health Informatics Service, working with our IM and t colleagues and working with our staff up and down the organisation, up and down the country to deploy brand new technologies to support our service users and ensure that we can continue to deliver high quality care. So this is the room on March the 15th on a Sunday evening when the very first consultation via virtual technology took place. It wasn't very involving at all. It was between me and my wife as I was testing a brand new product that we'd uh, sourced and trialled only previously once before. Following this internal test, we were able to work with our colleagues with, in the health informatics service and with Modality to deploy the one consultation platform across all of our care groups within the organisation. But we couldn't have done it without our staff, our digital champions, and especially with our service users all of it was down to involvement. If we'd done this in the cupboard, in here, on our own, and expected that it would be a successful deployment and that people would use it, we'd be very wrong. We wouldn't have got to the level of consultations that we've got to now. We had to rely on involvement. We had to engage with our staff. We had to engage with some very helpful service users during the early days of the trials for our brand new virtual consultation platform to ensure that it was safe, that it was reliable, and that it was going to help our staff and our service users to be able to stay in touch and continue to get the care that they needed. Now, this is an organization with eight and a half thousand staff and hundreds of services up and down the country across four care groups that are very different. We've got specialist services, mental health services, learning disability, physical health, community care. We had to find a product that would meet very specific needs. And in some cases, it still doesn't. We're still listening to your feedback and we're still working with our 
staff in the organisation, our suppliers and with our service users, we're still involving you to make sure that we can continue to tailor our offer and make sure that technology works for us and not the other way around. So, during this celebration week, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all of the staff that has worked with IMT and the service users and all of the staff that have worked in terms of deploying, feeding back, learning from the times when the product hasn't worked, learning from the times that it has worked but could be improved and generally just being fantastic at enabling us to get to a monumental um, amount of consultations achieved during the pandemic from March in lockdown right through now to September. So prior to March 2020, we had done zero virtual consultations. We'd done telephone consultations face to face, obviously, but virtual consultations with things like this, iPhones, laptops, webcams, no. Now we've done an astounding 19,000 virtual consultations. And because of the involvement being absolutely key, we look at the feedback on those. We've got an 80% successful feedback rate, which to be honest, is pretty, pretty impressive, but we're striving for more. We always do. So hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Hopefully that was quite interesting and uh, more interesting than uh, sat here listening to me will be the rest of the uh, celebrations. So thank you for your time and uh, good luck in the future. Bye-bye. Thank you for the information about one, one consultation. Um, next, we have some patient stories to share with you. These are from Simon, Jean and Gareth, who've been involved with the research team. Hello there, I'm Simon Farr. I live in Stoke-on-Trent. I had a major stroke in 2012, in May 2012. Um, I've got a small family, three boys and a wife. When I had my stroke, that affected them, not just myself. I was in hospital for six months at uh, North Staffs and I've come to the Haywood for three months for rehabilitation. I left the Haywood in a wheelchair, paralysed down the left hand side. That was good due to the stroke. When I was in hospital, when I had my stroke and I eventually come to more or less to my senses, I realised that I was paralysed from the neck down. And at the time I couldn't see, speak or hear. They eventually come back in time, one after the other, not all together. And that left me paralysed from the neck down. So, what was the research that you took part in? And how did you get to hear about it? And what was involved in the research? I heard about the research through uh, the Haywood Hospital. Mm. And uh, they introduced me to the research programme and asked me if I'd like to join. And I'd never say no to things like that because the research isn't just for myself, but it'd be nice to see if you could help other people through researching through what I've gone through and what I'm doing. And if it works, it works. And then it can be passed on to somebody else then. But if it doesn't work, at least then somebody knows why well, that doesn't work. And what are the benefits do you think that taking part provided you with taking part in that specific research study? With going through the research and the research has helped me with the, the nurses that have been giving me the injections as well. That They've had feedback from that which has helped them to help me and not only is it, am I, are they helping me but I'm helping them. So it's a, it's a big circle, we're all in that circle and nobody's breaking away from it and that's we need that circle to be linked and more and more people get in that circle the better it will be for, for everybody in my similar situations than me. And what was your support like from the research nurses and from the doctors and the I the can't fault any of the, the nurses that have helped me in doing it within the research. They've always they're very, very friendly, outgoing. If you want to laugh, you can have a laugh with them. They have a laugh with you. They make you feel so comfortable and so at ease with anything that you want and you there's just not a problem at all. And what would you say to anybody else who is thinking about taking part in any research studies? Go for it. There's, there's no um, downside of it. There's always an upside. You don't have to do it. There's no pressure. But if, if you were in a situation, I wouldn't say don't do it. I would say do it.
Hi, I'm Lucy and I'm a research nurse based in Shrewsbury. We've been talking to Jean and Gareth about their research experience. Their mother and son and have participated in two of our clinical drug trials into Alzheimer's disease. Jean is reading from a script for part of this video as she didn't want to forget what she wanted to say. Learning to accept that I have Alzheimer's was very difficult initially but we have learned to deal with it in our own way. Yeah, because when mum was first diagnosed with dementia, it was a very difficult thing to accept. In one situation, we had a bit of a set to, and mum screamed at me, you don't know what it's like to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I replied, and you don't know what it's like from my point of view. What do you mean by that? She retorted, to which I stormed, well, I'm just waiting for the day when you look at me and say, who are you? And that will rip my heart out. And mum stopped and said, Oh, I'm so sorry, I never thought about that. And we both burst into tears, hugged and vowed to try and fight it the best way we could. Because like Lucy said, mum wasn't taking on enough fluids, so the kidneys weren't working properly. And so she came off the, um, they took her off the trial because she hadn't got enough fluids, wasn't taking the fluids. <clears throat> then we bore to the camel back and, and she, her fluid levels went up again. Um, and then she just wasn't drinking enough after that, so she came off it the second time, and once she'd done it twice, you had to stop the trial. But that was, um, we were quite well into the trial. It was a two-year trial, I think, and we were about 14, 15, 16 months in, so it was a bit unfortunate, but in the end, it wouldn't have made any difference because the trial results said it, it wasn't affecting people with Alzheimer's. Yeah, we went for the next one because Paula said, um, would you be prepared to carry on with it if there's another one kind of one? Because I'm like, we're fighting this. We're not just going to give up. Uh, so I said, yeah, 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 we will. And the next one sort of thing. Um, but we knew mum was on the drug mm. because her legs went black. Uh, so we, that, that gave us both a little bit. You've, I said, you're on at least the half dose because you've got this. And if it does work and... Uh, cures Alzheimer's, you know, we know you're taking the drug now sort of thing and it kind of gave us, I don't know, a bit of a hope, which like I said, if you've not got hope, you've got nothing, have you? Well, you're quite good with that because we just never even think about it. It's because the placebo is, you hear all these stories about placebos working anyway, don't you? Well, yeah. So it's, there's the hope again that even on a placebo it's going to work and that's how we, that's how we deal with it now. It's just a case of trying to be positive, isn't it? Yeah. It was really nice when Mum came out with, well, if it does it, it might not help me now, but if it helps somebody in the future, you know, then she's done her part towards that, and that's great. And I, I just, I know it sounds, it's, it's minor, isn't it? But it, the people I've met, very nice, very, you know, very thoughtful and doing all they can sort of thing to make it easier for me. So yeah. I've got to be grateful, and I am. Dr. Kishman, and he's, he's funny, isn't he? He just comes in and yeah. talks, he never stops smiling. And yeah, very pleasant. And We've had as much contact as you know. I mean, I, Lucy will email me about the, the, the days when she goes and sees mum on her own, and I'll get an email says, I know because mum doesn't always remember, obviously. So mum, uh, Lucy will email me the stuff they talked about and what happened, and then I'll sort of say, oh, what happened when was that? So I can use that again to try and spark her off. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, just thank you, you know, for giving well, me the opportunity, yeah. yeah. Mm. Because it might just work. Hello, and uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, take a look at our presentation on patient and public involvement engagement in research. My name is Frances Davis, and I'm the research governance manager for the Trust. And I work alongside um, Jess Tunmore, who is our PPIE lead for research, and Ruth Lamley Burke, who's the head of research and innovation. Patient and public involvement and engagement is obviously at the centre of, of what we do, not only as a trust but especially in research. Uh, working with the NIHR um, and supported by the NIHR, um, it's, it's really important to us that the research that we do is done with our participants and not to 
our participants. I think in the past, um, research has sort of has been done something that's been done, and we then even the people who've been part of the study haven't necessarily known what's happened at the end of it. And that is something that we are working really hard to change. Um, we want to increase the transparency and we want to have patients and our trust populations involved right at the beginning from the conception of our projects because the, the participant experience is the, is the most important part of what we do because obviously research is to make things better for our patient and trust populations by redesigning services, introducing new drugs and treatments, or just bringing patients closer into their treatment um, so that they have an impact on the care that they get. At MPFT, uh, we work really hard to engage with and support the national agenda for research um, in the widest possible way. Currently, um, despite the, the current uh, COVID healthcare emergency. We have 59 studies um, classed as open, not all may be active at the moment, across five specialities, specialities being sort of the directorates in the broadest terms. We aim to have research in all the trust areas that we possibly can. And then we have another 23 more potential studies um, in setup. We've already recruited over 10,000 people to research studies in the last four years, which I think is a great achievement and shows how important research is to the trust, not only in the RNI department, but in the um, senior leadership of the trust as well. Um, and we've also recruited more recently over 200 participants to urgent public health research in response to the coronavirus health emergency which obviously required our rapid response and reworking of what and how we do research in order to make sure that everybody stays safe um, and that what the data that we collect is of high quality and usable. The, the lived experience of what our trust populations have um, is, is central to, to research. Um, research runs on the premise of what is called good clinical practice and the central tenement of that is the patient. We obviously want to get high quality research data as well, but the patient sits at the front and centre of everything we do. Patient um, should really say participant, all the trust populations, whether it be staff members, carers, service users themselves, however we can get people involved. It's an opportunity to input into the future of healthcare, the healthcare that affects you and your loved ones directly but, and also the healthcare design of the future. Um, we hope that we offer our PPIE um, representatives and members a unique opportunity to have a, an involvement and also bring their unique perspective to, to the table, which is different from the academic point of view or the clinical service point of view. And it's a really important perspective that we need to include. We're not expecting anyone to have technical knowledge of how research works. What is important um, is experience and opinion. Um, we need experts by these experts, you, you experts by experience to offer feedback and input into the, the research that we're doing. And we want to achieve excellence in our research. Um, we also want to know what works and what doesn't. So we also take part of, in the um, NIHR patient research, participant research engagement feedback survey, um, because we understand that although we aim to bring everyone along with us, it is also important that we as research, um, those who deliver research, if you like, are um, that we learn from experience as well. PPIE at MPFT, uh, we've got a number of groups across the trust um, that are specifically involved in research. Um, Keele University is obviously a major partner for the Trust and we work really closely with them. There's a the research user group based there and um, these are patients and service users, again the university populations and all who obviously overlap quite a lot with the Trust populations, who help to develop research questions, how research is designed and they provide invaluable advice on implementing research into practice which is obviously what we're all about. Um, patient carer and pa the patient and carer experience 
research, the PACE R group. It's a group of service users and carers interested in health and social care research. And this group contributes to the development of research and innovation policies, policies, strategies and standard operation procedures. Other specific work includes development of a variety of research projects at Keele and MPFT, such as the SWITCH trial. And a PACER group member is currently contributing to the University of York and Keele University Closing the Gap initiative, which is looking at the gap in life expectancy experienced by mental health service users. One of our PACER members will be sharing his experiences with you today also. So how can you get involved if you'd like to? There are various ways you can get involved. Um, you could you know, work alongside us or we can support you in creating your own research questions or you can be part of the groups that we have um, embedded within our research operation to help advise and share insight and experience into the research that we do. We undertake a large amount of research, obviously with our very active clinical academics that work between universities and the trust. And we are always looking for people in um, new areas, patients with lived experience and their friends, family, loved ones, all of the trust populations again, to have an input on the research that we are creating and looking to undertake. There are a variety of ways of being involved, as I say, um, and we can work alongside you gaining to get a feel of how you would like to be involved by um, there's some examples here. They provide research and um, provide feedback on research documents such as information sheets and consent forms, attend conferences and meetings, um, undertake training yourself um, or as I say, be a co-applicant on a funded grant, as one of our PACER members has, has done recently. Um, we would love to have you on board. I will now hand over to my colleague, Jess. Um, so I'm just going to pick up from where Fran was. Uh, just there's some more examples um, on the screen of how you can um, become involved. I think a really important one is generating new ideas for research because we want our research and the research that we do to be, to be meeting the needs of, of patients and the public um, and so we need we want to hear from you what you think is important so that our research is is led um, by that and as Fran said there's other ways um, so attending meetings with researchers and also dissemination so helping us to share the results of um, research to people that really need to to hear them uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about later uh, so in terms of what PPIE members can expect from researchers when you're working together is you should have a clear role and responsibility in terms of what you're going to put into the study um, and this will be spoke you'll you'll be spoken to about this before the study and it will be very much led by what you want to do so what input do you want to have um, and what strengths do you want to build on? What skills do you want to learn? Um, and how you think your lived experience can really make this piece of research really valuable. Um, so there it says training and support. So you'll be supported with anything that you need to be in to, to help you feel like you are confident in, in being involved in research. Uh, you also get payment for your expenses and sometimes there's some payment as well for your time. So there's a little bit of a financial incentive. So in terms of what we've done so far, uh, so the Lost in Space report, which you can see um, in full on the link there, or if you use the QR code, that should take you straight to the report. Um, and it was this report was produced by our patient and care experience group, so PACER, and it explores the experience of ru rurally based mental health service users who have a serious mental illness, their carers and their clinicians, and it talks about the particular barriers and challenges they face um, in accessing mental health services, and it addresses that. Um, so. Tim Lewington and Jean Nichols, who was a founding member of PACER, put together a, a bid for this and got some funding and, and, as I said, produced this report and this really good, valuable piece of research. So this is an example of, of one of our members working with staff to produce something that's really valuable. 
so some more examples of PPIE work are the Hayward User Group, um, the Peer Centre and the CAP groups. And Fran, if you're able to give a little bit more detail on those, please. Um, the CAP groups are um, clinically appraised, appraised topic groups. So the, this is a forum for people to come with questions um, that they think, why, why are we doing this? this way or why do we use this form or why is nobody looking at how this affects patients or service users um, it's a, a regularly convened group of a mixed um, a mix of people um, who sit down and appraise that that specific question and say well the reason we do it is a or the reason we do it is b or we don't know why we do it but there's this research out there or there's no research out there and then that can be used to um, further encourage or produce research grant applications and research projects for the future. Um, so we're just going to talk about dissemination which I briefly mentioned earlier and this is something that we feel really passionate about at MPFT and it, it's it's ensuring that the research that we carry out and that our patients are involved in is disseminated to the people that it needs to be. Uh, re research is, is is nothing really if it doesn't reach the people that it affects. Um, so we are working together with our pa patient and public members to ensure that we have the right routes that research can flow down and, and that it's accessible to the public um, so that we so we would produce lay summaries so that's the, you know the research put in a form that's understandable to to everyone um, and without PPI input into the dissemination phase as I said before, it wouldn't reach the people that it needed to. It might go to some journals and it might go to some very academic places, but in terms of reaching a wider audience, that's the important part and that's where PPIE is, is essential. So at the moment, we are working to broaden our PPIE membership. So we need you, essentially. We need people with lived experiences and those that can bring something unique to the table um, and I think what is what is important to note is that it, we really want this to be accessible to everyone. And it can be quite, you know, you might think, oh, what have I got to bring? Or I don't know much about research and you don't need you don't need to. What we're interested in is your opinions and your experiences and your willingness to share it with people. Um, and there's always something you can bring, always something you can bring. and researchers and academics that are carrying out the research then some of them won't have that experience and that's what we're missing and that's what makes research good quality and that's how we can produce research that will be applicable in the real world um, so if you would like to know more then please feel free to get in contact with either myself or Fran or Ruth um, there's a little QR code there again that you can scan and it should take you to the right pages, hopefully. So again, there's our names and our email and phone. You can also have a look on our Twitter and see what it's all about. There's some links to some more information throughout uh, the QR codes on the PowerPoint. But if you need any information, please do email us or ring us. As I said, we are working to broaden our membership and get more people involved in research and it's something that we all feel really passionate about so any questions anything you need please do get in touch um, and thank you very much a warm welcome to all of you my name is David it was my community mental health nurse Hillary who first suggested that I may benefit from joining the local PPI group at Shrewsbury I took her advice and joined what was then my local patient and carer group, Chorus. That was nearly 15 years ago. Life has moved on and the NHS has seen many changes and reorganisation in those years. The Chorus group was run by the South Shropshire and Staffordshire Foundation Trust, the then local health authority. More recently, this has transitioned and become the Midlands Partnership based at Stafford. 
participating in the daily issues that arise in any organisation the size of the NHS is never dull. It is both lively and stimulating, providing great companionship. I immensely enjoy being part of the group that represents and looks after the interests of both patients and carers. The overriding sense of camaraderie and humour of all members of this lively and thoughtful club provides a purpose in life, at a time when it is so easy to fall into complacency and sometimes the solitude of retirement. One of the great advantages you will find when you join us is not just the sense of family, but the way that no pressure whatsoever is put upon you. You decide how much time you can contribute and what skills you can bring to the table. At no time will you feel any pressure to increase your commitment or be asked to undertake any task you might not feel comfortable with or that you feel not qualified for. No one will ever make you feel obligated in any way. You are always in control and doing what you are comfortable with. Come and join us and put a spring in your step. You will feel and soon feel that you belong. The chorus group consisted of a group of about 30 people made up of NHS staff, volunteers and patients and carers. We had a broad range of issues to tackle. This was a more of a managing group rather than specifically a research group. We dealt with issues that arose day to day, either within Redwoods, the mental health hospital unit we were attached to, or within the area served by the Shrewsbury hospitals. I was never made to feel that I was a newcomer who didn't know the ropes. Things I knew were nothing of were patiently explained to me. We met every month and in no time I found that I was able to contribute. Chorus was a great environment to learn and get to grips with NHS speak. It's endless acronyms. Often there were short presentations by NHS staff and others. These introduced us to new areas for consideration and comment. The two to three years I spent with the group flashed by and we were so sorry that reorganisation within the Trust meant the chorus would close. Following on from this, I joined a similar group at Stafford for a short period. It was during this time that the Pace R group was founded by the Permanent Research and Innovation Group at Stafford. Two years ago, I was invited to become a patient research champion for the National Institute of Health Research, the NIHR. This group meets four to five times a year and is drawn from NHS health specialists, health practitioners and patient carers from all walks of life. The group works directly with the NIHR and has the broadest of remits of all the PPIE networks. There are over 100 PRCs in the West Midlands alone. This initiative is countrywide, constituted in regional clusters of health trusts. It's a privilege to be working with so many experts, drawn from a myriad of healthcare disciplines, disciplines that include clinical studies, research nurses, pharmacists, cancer and palliative care staff, dementia and hospice staff, the ambulance service, prison consultants, departmental managers and staff. The list is endless. Practitioners from across our region. The West Midlands is an authority that every day cares for in excess of two million people, taking care of you quite literally from the cradle, cradle to the grave. Our meet, meetings are routinely attended by 35 to 40 people. They are lively and well informed and enjoyable. Meetings that really inspire everyone to become involved with such dynamic group of professionals and volunteers drawn from the public. It's truly rewarding just to be part of this amazing health network. I have highlighted three projects that I hope you will agree show the breadth of topics that we are involved with. I'm fortunate to have come from a life of research, design, engineering of everyday day products and environments 
as this enabled me to bring specialist skills to the table. Others, like yourselves, perhaps bring a multitude of other skills. Others have been carers and then brought up the next generation. Mothers and grandmothers bring amazing skills and excel in family management. When they join, they keep all of us in check and focused on the realities of life. The first was an unexpected request relating to RECAP. The project was held by University of Aberdeen. Through my associations with PESAR, I was approached by Aberdeen University, who asked if I was able to, re to join a group discussion in London with the RECAP team. The meeting of about 30 of people like myself, drawn from every corner of the UK, reviewed the final proposals regarding the creation of a national protocol that defined in detail how all research teams that involve public volunteers must format their reports and include feedback to patients who took part in that research. This was an extremely relevant discussion because we all represented research volunteers in our own community. This illustrates how vital it is that you join us in volunteering. Second example of how PPIE work involves research volunteers is one that has great relevance to people like myself who have a significant mental illness and SMI. Closing the Gap CTG is a new initiative that has been set up to investigate the serious differentials between physical and mental health outcomes. Few people appreciate that mental health patients have a 30% lower life expectancy than any other people in the population. This 30% equates to a reduction of up to 20 years in life expectancy. Apart from the fact that this could present a very real possibility of an inbuilt bias within the NHS, it is also a major effect upon the economy. This being brought about by considerable increased health costs as well as direct reduction in tax income and an increase in social benefits. There are no winners, only losers. This research project has attacked, attracted a realistic budget to cover five years' research. The PACE R was given a presentation of the aims of the CDG project at Stafford. Following this, I was invited to attend a focus group meeting at York. The purpose of this meeting was to establish what were perceived as the most salient and dominant graphic identities for CDG. This to provide realistic targets so that the project promotional and awareness campaign could be established on realistic realities and not based on false assumptions. The meeting was very much hands-on. It was led by a design facilitator whose belief brief was to focus on public perceptions of mental health. This to establish how best to prioritise the fundamental challenges that the public perceived as issues and the seriousness of mental health in the community. The third example that I was invited to take part in was the national launch of the CTG project. This was planned to take place at the um, Trust's headquarters at Stafford. This event was attended by an invited audience of approximately 70 plus people. Presentation was also broadcast live via Zoom and is still available for you on YouTube. My role was to take part in an interview representing patients with lived, lived experience of SMI. Another interviewee represented a lifelong carer's lived experiences. Other speakers with great expertise treat treating SMI has discussed the many aspects of mental health challenges. It was an excellent conference presentation that fully and clearly debated the issues involved in mental health care 
and its social impact on the wider community. My opinion was that the conference succeeded admirably in making a substantial case for the setting up of Closing the Gap. Come and join us. Putting your hand up enables you to find out many things about research that you never fully appreciated. You probably think that you are too small a cog to affect anything. However, cogs are critical to the running of engines that drive development forward. If that cog is missing, the engine of progress does not work. Please come and join us. You will not regret your decision. We are a friendly lot that will warmly welcome you. You are key members of the NHS. None of us here are prima donnas. We are an enthusiastic group of patients and carers, like yourselves, from a multitude of backgrounds. You will enjoy the friendly banter or the meetings. You can now help from your home. All our future meetings are destined to be held virtually online. So no lengthy journeys and early starts, we'll come to you. We have a common purpose, that is to help the NHS help you and me. Helping to enhance this key national service to understand your needs. This nation can be proud of those wonderful, dedicated people. The COVID-19 pandemic is a great tragedy for those who regrettably contract this invisible foe. It is heartbreaking to hear of those who have this deadly pathogen. It is even more distressing to see someone close to us suffer and die. It is an unimaginable painful experience for us all. We are a great debt to our doctors and nurses who are the rocks of this nation in these unprecedented times. The past 10 months have been harrowing for all the NHS staff and please do not forget that many have given their lives caring for patients. I'm proud to be supporting these unstintingly dedicated people. Thank you. Thank you. It is so important to hear about patients' experiences. Um, we are, we're now going to hear about the Forensic Services newsletter project that service users have been involved with. Hello, everyone. Um, we're, we've come to talk to you about a piece of work that's happened recently at the Happerton Centre um, during lockdown. So um, my name is Betsy Walker, I'm clinical lead OT and I'm going to be talking to Jane and Marcel who will let them introduce themselves. So Jane. Hi I'm Jane Chenwell, I'm a recovery support worker at the Happerton Centre. Thank you and Marcel. Hey I'm Marcel and I'm an ex-service user and I do a lot of work with the today's subject. Thank you. So uh, we're going to talk about the newsletter that you guys were really involved in in getting started. So um, first of all, could you just tell us how did it start and where did the idea come from? So I was first informed about an initiative from uh, OT. So that's Michael Hayden and Betsy Walker. Um, we were told that there was um, a newsletter that we maybe could uh, do on the ward. Um, so I received an email and we had a look into this and we thought it's something we could do. Great stuff. Um, um, was it that there was something missing at that point? Had, had things changed in terms of the activities people were doing on the ward because of lockdown, Jane? Yes, due to COVID, um, we saw a point where we couldn't actually get groups of people together, which would so we could only offer minimal activity on a one to one basis. So this was something we thought might help to fill the void and, and that it did. Great. So how did you hear about it and get involved, Marcel? I first heard from Jane. She asked me to get involved with the newsletter, the editing side of things. Uh, we meet on most Wednesdays to, do, to discuss what sort of things we can add to the newsletter. 
Okay. And um, were you already involved with things with the with working with Jane and the involvement side of things? Yes, I'm. I'm very heavily involved in the recovery college. So okay. Jane, once the COVID came around, the recovery college was put on hold. So there was very little to offer the service users over at the Hatherton Centre. So the newsletter was an initiative that began to to try and fill the void, as Jane said give people a bit of meaningful you know activities so there's all sorts of different things in there to keep people occupied yeah yeah that makes sense um so so it was a different it meant that you were working in a different way and, and not able to come into the unit like you usually would have been marcel how yeah. how did you get on with the technology I, I guess you were having to use microsoft teams and and that kind yeah. of thing Yes, we've had to use Teams. Originally, we were using the one consultation that was available for the guys at the Hatterton, which is now, we're now using Teams as it, it, it works better. There's less lag, the, the picture quality is better. And for editing, yes, I have to use Publisher. So they send everything to me via email and I edit it with Publisher. Okay. And how about you, Jane? How have you got on with joining everybody up with the, the technology side of things? Uh, well, um, so first of all, we have a meeting on a Wednesday, so we meet with the STRs, so that's um, Pamela Tollis, Simon Harry, we have Sally Jennings and Rianne Matthews, and we get together and then we um, get the ward work basically, so the, the work comes from the wards to myself via email, and then I then send those emails out to Marcel. So the challenges um, that we came across was that some of the publisher files were too large to send out, um, via email so that's when we had to then put it into a PDF we are working on that by clipping down the file size um, we have managed to do that but that could can be a challenge from time to time but the fact that the files too large is testament to how much work is going into the newsletter definitely so it's a work in progress absolutely <laughs> yeah great so so we've heard a bit about the kind of getting started and and the using technology so that you can be in touch with each other um, where are you getting the ideas for the content because it sounds like there's lots going into it what sort of things are you including in in the newsletter um well we have um puzzles which seems to go down very well um we have lots of fact pages um like um the rate that bamboo grows at why is sea salt at uh, sea water salty um we have lots of things like horoscopes um we have uh, facts about nature recipes uh, like I say, we have crosswords and um, all sorts of things and all these are provided by our service users and this is something that they are quite committed to and we have regular service users that, that, that produce regular work that goes into the newsletter. So lots of things. Is there anything else that Jane's missed there, Marcel, that has been included in the newsletter? Uh, not much. So the, there is the ducklings, some ducklings at the Hatherton Centre that they've, uh, they've timelined. Is there, there's, they do this because it's now a monthly edition, they do this month in history. So it's facts about historical events this month in history. There's a there's a music chart. So the top 10 this month, 10 years ago. And then the ideas come from us from in the meeting, but as Jane said, from other service users as well. If you want to have their little input, they can, they're more than happy to take ideas from anybody really. Great stuff. So, so something for everybody is kind of the the aim. That's the aim. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I I guess that's one of the ways of sort of getting as many people involved as possible. Is there anything else that you've done to to try and make it that as many people will be involved, um, make contributions or at least read it as as possible? So there have been competitions. For example, the name of the newsletter it used to be the Hatherton the Hatherton newsletter. It's now called the Hatherton Waterfall. Uh, they gave prizes for the winner, the winner's contribution to the name. There's now a uh, competition for the logo, I believe, Jane? Yes, that's right. So yeah. we put the we put the service used at the heart of what we do. Um, we consider that at every stage. So from editing to the contributions, to the ideas, to the name, to the logo. So it's always about the service user. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, and I know, I know you've worked with quite a lot of people on this, isn't there? And you, you've mentioned a few of the um, people in the STR roles. Is there anyone else that you that you want to mention that you, has been involved in the work with you? Yeah, and um, we also uh, we have um, Michael Hayden, 
here's the OT on Radford. Um, he was heavily involved at the beginning and he was able to give us some pointers on how to develop and collaborate the uh, the newsletter with service users. And like I say, that's something that's uh, really, really important. The play. So you've you've mentioned that you're you're on a, you're a few editions in now. How, how many editions are you up to now, Jane? Um, this will be our ninth edition, wow. and uh, we've got um, seven of those editions were weekly editions for Radford. And then when it was developed into the Haverton newsletter, um, we were finding that there was so much work that we were having to develop it as a monthly um, newsletter, so we could get all the information and get that out to Marcel, send that uh, edited, and then that could come back, and then we could get it all printed. So, so I was I was wondering if anything had changed over the as you since you got started from things that you've learned. So there's so it's gone from being weekly to monthly. Yes. Is, is there anything else, Marcel, that's changed about the way that you're doing it? No, from not learning? the way we're doing it. Just the content, really. Okay. It's grown, grown and grown, and it's. it's you know, it started off a few pages, that like five, six pages, and now it's massive. So it's just, it's it's growing? It is growing, still growing. Um, if I can just add that from the newsletter, new roles have come out. So we have a photographer that does the photographs, which is a service user. Um, those go into the newsletter. And we also have, there's, there's a possibility to have some roles for journalism. So we can have service users that are actually dedicated to that role. That sounds like a great idea. I was going to ask if the, you know, what are the plans? What's coming next for for the newsletter? So there's there's those new roles. Is there anything else, Jane, that you you're hoping to to see it develop into? Well, currently it's it's Haverton, and then we also have another ward that's included in Forensics, which is low secure. So it's possible it's possible to actually include uh, another ward into that, and then hopefully over to Clee Hospital in Shrewsbury. And that could be sort of part of the initiative where we actually join those up. That would be quite exciting. Yeah, that sounds good. And Marcel, it's this is obviously um, it's kind of, as you said, it's developed into being a much bigger piece of work than you'd initially expected. Is there anything that's particularly surprised you about this piece of work and, and what's how it's worked out? How well received it is by the service users and their input as well. It is very, it is valued and there's a lot and lot of input from the service users, that's surprising. Oh, that's really good to hear. How about you, Jane? Is there anything that's taken you by surprise? Yeah, the, vol the volume of service users that actually want to contribute and you can just be walking through the day area and they actually grab you and ask you if you they can contribute something to that and they have an idea. Equally, we have staff that will find reading the newsletter and ask to take a copy on their break, which is great. That's really good. And I, I think I remember you telling me about um, staff that were off isolating and really valued being kept in, in the loop with the newsletter as well. Yeah, we can also send that out um, as an attachment and they can read that at home. So they, they've kept in the loop about what's going on in the wards. That's a really nice way of keeping everybody in touch, isn't it? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. Um, so have you, have you had any feedback from anybody about um the newsletter yes i have recently had some feedback um generally the feedback's um very positive uh, which is good to hear so one of our service users uh, said that he had his input into the newsletter uh, was a fact sheet and generally topics like um about sharks and then um about the salt water about the rate that bamboo grows at um he's also said that he's enjoyed doing it um, another service user said that he feels that it's a very positive thing on the ward um, and to know what everybody's going through and it brings everyone together. So that's really positive. Oh, that's really good to hear, isn't it? Makes the hard work worth it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. OK. So is, is there anything else that you think people should know about with the newsletter that, and the work that you've been doing with this before we before we finish? How about you, Marcel? Anything? Any final thoughts? No, just watch this space. It's going to grow and grow and grow. Hopefully, as Jane says, it becomes uh, a part of everybody, every in, uh, forensic unit's uh, people's journey for the service users. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. How about you, Jane? Any other any other things to mention? Well, like I say, I think there's roles that can come from the newsletter that could be service user roles. Um, it is gathering moss, so it's getting bigger and bigger um, we're getting regular input put from other wards so 
as the newsletter grows, we need more people on board. So I think there's a space there to invite service users to join and contribute and help to put the actual newsletter together. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you very much for telling us about the piece of work that's been happening and um, we'll look forward to seeing more editions of it. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you for that. Finally, today we're going to hear about the Arts for Health programme, which um, uses arts for helping service users and carers. Hi everyone, I'm Jess Kent, the Arts for Health lead for Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. And myself and my colleagues are going to tell you a little bit about how Arts for Health has adapted to our new situation over the last seven months. Obviously, we've had to abandon our normal programme where we use many different artists and musicians to deliver our programmes on the wards and in the community. Where possible, we've been able to shift some of our delivery online, but inevitably this can leave people without access to the internet out of the loop. Often those are our most vulnerable uh, service users. But we've still been trying to connect in other ways. Please have a look at our website where there's lots of information of how you can get involved um, and you can see some of the things we've been up to under the heading of where there's art there's hope so you can see the uh, the link there to our website please have a look at that and see how you can get get involved and join in to replace our songs for you project and as a way of keeping in touch and, and keeping that connection going with our service users and carers we introduced a program called ring and sing after all even if you don't have internet everybody has a landline so Helen, my colleague, will now tell you a little bit about Ring and Sing and how it came about and how it is supporting some of our most vulnerable service users. Hello, I'm Helen Wilson, Arts for Health project worker. I'd like to talk to you about uh, our Ring and Sing project, which replaces songs for you, for those living with dementia and their carers. It's become a vital lifeline. Whilst some of the participants are mostly at home and do not engage in other usual activities during the week. Every other week, our practitioners in Stafford, Jilly, Nichols, and Sal Tong in Shropshire call our service users and carers for a chat and to just check how they're doing in this current climate. Sometimes participants are feeling a bit low and frustrated. Having from someone, a call from someone who cares is so important. The practitioners can have a chat with them and then introduce a song or two, asking the service users and the carers what they want to sing. Gillian and Sal have some lovely songs. Most of the time our service users and carers really want to join in. Some even have a song ready and want to lead. Others might have their instrument with them, guitar or a drum, and they want to join in with Sal or Gillian. The participants look forward to hearing from our practitioners. It maintains a routine, regularity, familiarity and connection, as well as the joy of singing together, which songs our community programme gave. By the end of the call and sing song, everyone is in a good mood and can't wait to chat and sing again. Here are some lovely quotes. The call and singing session brought a tear to my eye that cheered me up. I've had a laugh. When can we meet up again? You always cheer everybody up. It's so nice that somebody remembers. Thanks a million for calling. Having a sing song gives us something to do. It stops us sleeping from the, during the day and then we sleep better at night. Lovely having a chin wag and a sing song. Always enjoy it. It's 
brought back a lot of memories and really lifted my spirits. We hope to continue our ring and sing sessions over the autumn and into 2021 until there is any prospect of Songs For You sessions restarting. We are very grateful to Jilly and Sal for their valuable work. Here is a short video of Sal delivering one of her sessions. And you can hear the service users joining in and responding. Can you feel the love tonight? It is where we are. It's enough for this wide-eyed wanderer that we got this far. And can you feel the love tonight? That's it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bring me my bowl, open, open in gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Oh, right. Do you fancy singing one with me? I bet you'll know this one. Okay. I see trees of green. Um, some people have some songs ready like you and other people don't and I have one person who loves to drum so I play rock and roll and they do some drumming and uh, yeah it's a very very lively afternoon I have to say yeah it starts in an A Bob an A chord of A I can't an A oh I tell you what can you remember a C what? Can you remember the C? Do the chord of C. Uh, there we are. Let's 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 get kicked off with the chord of C. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain. Coming round the mountain. Coming round the mountain when she comes. in the chord of C got the whole world in his hands here we go are we ready one two three <laughs> Wednesday afternoon. Oh, how do you feel about bursting into song then? 
And here is a lovely picture of one of our service users and his daughters who recently took part in a broadcast by the BBC about Ring and Sing for Midlands Today. The broadcast was to coincide with World Alzheimer's Day on Monday 21st of September. Len, who you can see there with his drums, really enjoyed that. Uh, the sessions really boost his spirits, talking to Sal on the phone and being able to play along as she sings songs and, and uses her guitar. This is in the absence of any of his usual activities and visits, which he misses so much. Another idea we've come up with is to provide individual art packs for inpatients arriving on the wards. We already had provided um, boxes, art boxes of art materials and reading for wellbeing materials, but um, we were very conscious that it was difficult for the staff to use these without having to share the materials. So as a way of avoiding cross-infection, these individual art packs are a great way to support service users, to give them something to do on the wards. And it's a lovely gift as they arrive uh, into, into the centre. So far, there's great feedback about these packs from staff. And there's no reason why we shouldn't continue producing these packs to hand out to new arrivals in the forthcoming months. Here you can see a picture of Ashley Wall. Ashley is one of our musicians who normally delivers concerts to patients um, at St George's wards. Ashley has put together a video of songs for people to enjoy and sing along to. Have a listen now to see, see what you think. Ashley guys, hello. Hope you're all having a nice day. Um, it's a shame I can't be there with you, but uh, I'd like to share some songs with you. Um, from the comfort of my home. So we're going to start off with Frank Sinatra's Fly Me to the Moon. Fly me to the moon Let me play among the stars Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars In other words Hold my hand In other words Baby kiss me Let me sing forevermore You are all I long for All I worship and do adore In other words Please be true Or in other words I love you Fly me to the moon Let me play among the stars Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars In other words Hold my hand In other words Baby kiss me with song and let me sing forevermore you are all I long for all 
I worship and do adore In other words, please be true Oh, in other words In other words I love you Hooray! Yes, Frank Sinatra fly me to the moon. Got my cup of coffee, got my guitar, got my songbook, I'm ready to play. Um, I have a feeling some of you will have seen me before, so you know what to expect. But for those who don't, I play uh, a mixture of classic covers right from the, the 50s up to the modern day. And this next one coming up is by a young lad called George Ezra. And this song's titled Budapest. In Budapest, my hidden treasure chest, golden grand piano, my beautiful gist, oh you, oh you, I'd leave it all. My acres of land I have achieved. It may be hard for you to stop and believe, but for you. I'd leave it all Oh, for you Oh, you I'd leave it all Give me one good reason Why I should never make a change Baby, if you hold me Then all of this will blow My many artifacts, the list goes on If you just say the word, I'll, I'll up and run on to you Oh, you, ooh, I'd leave it all Oh, for you, oh, you, I'd leave it all Oh, give me one good reason why I should never Baby, if you hold me, then all of this will go away Give me one good reason why I should never make a change Baby, if you hold me, then all of this will go Feedback has been great from the wards um, about these videos. 
We've had some from Ashley, we've had some from Jillian Nichols and Sal Tonge, where they've been able to, the staff have been able to use these videos at diff difficult times on the wards when people need a bit of stimulation. And it's also been impossible for some of our practitioners to deliver sessions via MS Teams, just as we're doing now uh, as part of this celebration week. Our dance and movement artists, plus our, some of our other musicians, have been able to deliver sessions via Teams directly to the wards to support patient well-being. And it's been a really nice way to keep that connection going, uh, because obviously they're responding to, to the people on the ward and the people on the ward responding to the musicians. And it almost creates a kind of live concert, even though it's still over a screen. And over the late summer, once restrictions were lifted, we arranged for some of our musicians and artists to deliver concerts in the ward gardens of the older adult wards. Accessing the garden via the outside gate and maintaining a safe distance to deliver the concert. So here you can see Sal on Oak Ward. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon and uh, I think the patients were so glad to see her again in person, even if it was at a distance, and to be able to enjoy her music, her laughter and her jokes and her stories. And the lovely Hannah and Brian, they've also been to visit uh, visit the wards via the garden gate. <laughs> and uh, they're very well known within Redwoods for their live music concerts in the past. So inpatients have been very happy to see their faces again and hear their lovely music and songs, even at a distance. Ellen Abab, my colleague, will now tell you a little bit about our online art gallery and word gallery, which we put together to enable service users, carers, staff and inpatients to contribute their artwork and writing to. Hi, my name is Ellen Abab and I work for Arts for Health at MPFT. And I'd like to talk to you today about two of our online projects that we've launched this year, um, the word gallery and the art gallery. So starting with the art gallery then, um, this came about when it became obvious that we weren't going to be able to run the usual trust art competition this year. We will, we'll, I'm sure, go back to, to that when we can, hopefully next year. Um, but for now, people can share their artwork via the online gallery that we've created instead. We've already had loads of great submissions, so I'd encourage you to have a look on there. So yeah, you can see that's what the page looks like. There's thumbnails on there, all the artwork you can click through and then just scroll through a slightly bigger view of the artwork there so there's lots of nice stuff on there so I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that so it's a real mix of um, service users and staff as well as family members and carers who've got involved this time and it's great to see that we've had um, more, more staff represented than in previous years so that's nice. We've had some nice feedback from people who've taken part. Um, one um, staff member who supported somebody she knew to send in some work um, to send in a painting who'd been in experiencing some anxiety during the lockdown and this boosted her confidence um, and gave her something to focus on and that same staff member felt that it was um, very helpful for people, people who are you know having uh, experiencing difficulties. Um, so if you'd like to get involved yourself if um, you send photographs of your artwork to me at eleanor.bab at mpft.nhs.uk and if you could send us high res 300 dpi jpeg images if possible and the reason we ask for high quality images now is that some of the wards have wanted to get them made up into prints um, for the lounges and um, patient areas um, so it just enables us to do that um, photography you can also send that in in its own right that's perfectly acceptable and when you email me if you could just tell me um, the title of your artwork and a brief description and how and if you would like your name displayed um, if you would like to remain anonymous then that's perfectly fine as well of course and there's more about all of that on the Arts for Health website if you would like a bit of inspiration we've also got some arts activity sheets on there um, that look like this um, there's 11 of those on there on various subjects they're short little projects you don't need very many specialist materials to do them um, things like wax rubbing drawing dogs um, 
Zentangles. Many thanks to Debbie Todd, our art, inpatient art group facilitator in Stafford from Protean Art for creating the ones you can see on screen there. And also to the Arts for Health charity hospital rooms um, for allowing us to share theirs on our website as well. So you can find those on the Where There's Art, There's Hope page of the website, which I'm going to try and show to you. So that's here. That's got stuff about everything we've been doing this year. Um, and then down at the bottom, there are those uh, sheets that I was just telling you about. Um, and for staff, you can also um, download those from the SharePoint on uh, the Arts for Health page on there. So moving on to the word gallery, this is an even newer project which we're launching today. So that's great. Um, we wanted to do something similar for creative writing that we'd done as we'd done with the art gallery. We hoped it might be a useful way for people to make connections with each other after this really strange year that's meant we've all been more distant from each other. And I suppose the irony is that we've all been through this tumultuous shared experience together but mostly we ha haven't actually been together and there's so much to unpack about what's happened and how we've experienced it and so much that's worth remembering and even celebrating and certainly reflecting on and I think it's worthwhile simply to document some of those things that have just never happened before like the th first Thursday clap um, springs to my mind um, which for me was very moving but also strange and eerie um, I was putting my daughter to bed at the time, so I wasn't clapping myself, um, but I could hear my neighbours um, in the village where I live. Uh, and it's one of those moments that you just uh, don't don't forget. Um, so that's, anyway, I'm getting off the subject a little bit, but what I think I'm getting at is that a lot has happened and creative writing affords us an opportunity to share our experiences with each other, which I think can only be a good and positive thing. Many thanks to Bridget um, for the poem that you can see on screen there um, from the Hogwarts Art Group. I'm just going to share now with you a couple of poems that um, the authors have very kindly recorded um, for this presentation today. So the first of these is Time by Sarah Lees, and it's a poetic imagining of a grandparent answering her grandchild's questions about 2020. So I'll just play that for you now. Time. Nana, will you tell me the story of that year? The one in which the pandemic came and everyone lived in fear. Oh child, yes, of course I'll tell you. But something that is true. My reflections of that time are quite different. Here, sit, I'll tell you. Yes, there was great fear and we all had to stay in and hide. But that year gave us great gifts. It wasn't fear all of the time. The shops brought down their shutters, signs on all of the doors. The cars all silenced their engines, less footfall on the floors. The streets lit up with rainbows for everyone to see. They clapped on streets and balconies, and for once the whole world felt free. You see, what happened in 2020, if you're looking for silver linings? The world stood still for quite some time. There were no rules or timings. The children finally had time to play and discover who they were. They stayed at home with their families. Homeschooling did cause a stir. But we relaxed into a new life, one full of time for things, for baking and painting and dancing and playing instruments with strings. We learned about each other, no daily life or stress. Some days it was a struggle to even just get dressed. But then we relaxed into the pyjama days. Life took a slower pace. We looked at life with different eyes. It took a newfound grace. We had breakfast together for what seemed like the first time in years. When we hurt, we loved and we dried each other's tears. A new sense of togetherness came, sometimes through virtual means. What it meant that we all kept in touch, even the grumpy teens. We learned that we could choose our times and decide how best well spent. No rules or routines or arguing, it just didn't make sense. A proper work-life balance, no working the early hours. 
We had time to spend on things that mattered, laughing, dreaming and planting flowers. Now it's safe to say that perhaps not everyone felt the way I do, but I'm sure there will be others that hold the very same view. The time we had been given felt like a gift, you see. It's time we'll never get again. That time, it set us free. Lovely. Thank you um, to Sarah Lees for recording that for us. And the second one is called Enter the Office by Michelle Dyke. Enter the Office by Michelle Dyke. The definition of a team is all working together to achieve one goal, an oiled machine to know our jobs and to know our role. We each have a knowledge, a skill and strength to bring, but just lately it seems we all have a different song to sing. We can feel a thankless task when only the wrong has been said. We have just become so busy, so wrapped up in our head. The little things have become so big an annoyance in our day that we find moaning and groping is the norm the only way. It can spread like wildfire and consume everything in its path. So let's try to stop the trend. Let's stop this negativity's wrath. We look out for each other's wellness and peace of mind. Let's take a look through others' eyes, see the good and just be kind. Not everything will be easy or really go to plan, but we all need the attitude that I know I will and I know I can. Our lives have gone online and communication's gone askew. Bedrooms have become the office. Working from home is the new. So when you enter the office and things are not as it would seem, it's because most of our day is talking to people through a computer screen. That's great. Thank you to Michelle for doing that one for us. Um, so we've had some nice feedback on the word gallery as well. Um, there's this one person who um, found it very helpful to get their thoughts and feelings down on paper and um, another person said that they thought it was great to have a safe place to share their writing um, and that it had helped her um, with her own mental health. Um, so if you would like to get involved, um, if you've been inspired to write something or you've already written something, then please do email um, it to me at eleanor.bab.mpft.nhs.uk and again if you could tell us how and if you would like your name displayed with your work that's great. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, what kind of writing are we asking for and what, sh what should it be about. So we've left this really wide open, um, it could be short stories, it could be poetry, you know, it could be more personal reflections and stories. And in terms of theme, um, it might be a response to or a reflection on some aspect of the pandemic. It could be about your experiences during this time. It could be something completely unrelated because um, we could all do with a break for it, from it. Um, it could be about your hopes for the future or some positive discovery or change that you've made during this time. We've all experienced it in different ways and no two people's experiences are going to be the same and we would love to hear about how it's been for you. If you would like a bit of inspiration we've um, got two ideas on the website to help you out with that. Um, and one of these I'm going to just tell you a little bit about now um, which is about haikus. So um, for those of you who may not be aware, is this is a short Japanese verse form. Uh, usually got nature it's usually got nature as the theme and there's usually a reference to the seasons and there's some sort of contrast between two things. And in the English version there are usually three lines following this pattern of five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second line and five syllables in the last line. So I want to just share with you an example, which is an old Japanese um, haiku called The Old Pond by Matsuo Basho. And I'll just read it to you. An old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Splash. Silence again. So you can see this uh, follows the pattern of the five, seven, five syllables like that. Um, it's got the reference to nature and this contrast between 
the silence and the sound of the frog jumping into the pond. I had a go myself at writing one about the pandemic, so I'll just very quickly share that with you. It's not as good as the Japanese one. Um, pandemic haiku. Lockdown sounds changing. Bird song louder than before. Children relaxing. You can see I've followed the, um, the format there with the um, syllables. And yeah, I guess the contrast in there is between the sound of the bird song and the, the sound of the children. So if you are going to have a go at writing one yourself, I would suggest perhaps focusing in on a detail or a moment or a feeling. There's not much time to tell a story um, in three lines. Um, uh, of course, you can break the rules about the syllables and the lines if you want to. Um, and there's loads of examples online uh, that you can check out. I'll just share one more haiku with you before I finish um, because it's a funny one. Haikus are easy, but sometimes they don't make sense. Refrigerator. So yeah, there's, there's that. Um, it made me smile. Uh, so yeah, we've got the art gallery and the word gallery. If you want to get involved, you can email your work, your creative writing or photographs of your artwork to me at that email address. Um, and yeah, so thank you for listening and watching and goodbye. Thank you, Eleanor. And I hope some of you will find the time to contribute to our galleries for others to share your talents. If you want to get in touch at all, here are my contact details, phone numbers and details of the website, plus our Facebook page. Please take a look at this when you get a chance. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of this eventful week. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you to Arts for Health. Now that is the end of our programme today. We hope you found it interesting. Please join us tomorrow for more presentations about involvement that we hope you will enjoy. Bye bye for now.